And greetings, saints of the Most High. Welcome to the Messianic Tour Observer. I'm Rod Thomas, and I want to thank you for taking the time to fellowship with me here today. And as always, it is our hope, trust, and prayer that this installment of TMTO finds you, your families, and fellowships well and blessed. Well, this is the place where obedience and faith intersect. This is part two of our series within a series, and I've entitled this particular post, The Righteous Shall Live by Their Faith. The Righteous Shall Live by Their Faith. In part one of this series, within a series, we lightly examined Romans chapter 3, verses 21 and 22. In that examination, we biblically defined what the righteousness of Elohim consists of, what the righteousness of Elohim, of God, means from a biblical perspective. And if you by chance did not get the opportunity to either read or listen to that discussion, I would direct you over to our website, themessianictourobserver.org, themessianictourobserver.org, and just go ahead and type in just the place where obedience, or just even part of that title, the place where obedience and faith intersect, or you could just type in righteousness. And you should receive the list of posts that have that topic in it. It's a really good search engine. And look for the post that is entitled, The Righteousness of God is the Place Where Obedience and Faith Intersect, Part 1. And the specific title for that part of these two-part series is, What is the Righteousness of God? And I'll go ahead, if you want to just go ahead to this particular one, and you happen to be on the website, go ahead and click the link to that post, and you'll be taken over to the transcript for that posting. But picking up from where we left off in part one of this series, I want to really drill down today on what it biblically means for one to live by faith. The passage that will launch our discussion is Romans chapter 1, verse 17, which, according to the Aramaic English New Testament translation, it reads as follows. For in it, and the it here, is the gospel, the basura. For in the gospel is revealed the righteousness of Elohim, from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous by faith will live, or the righteous will live by his faith, in most of the authorized English translations. Now, we discussed the meaning of the first half of this verse in our discussion post entitled, The Righteousness of God Revealed from Faith to Faith its true meaning and reality for God's people. And if you've not had the opportunity to listen to or read that post and you are so led, simply click the title hyperlink that I will place in the show's transcript for your convenience. But today we will examine the second half of this verse and determine what, it, what living by faith, by, by one's faith, living by one's faith is supposed to look like from a biblical perspective. As I've mentioned on a few occasions throughout this Paul and Hebrew Roots series, long series, <laughs> Shaul was a product of his impressive formal rabbinic education, which is to say that Paul, Shaul, was a brilliant apologist and a brilliant Torah scholar, which is also to say that in his own right, Shaul was not so much the originalist that denominationalists might think and suggest that he was. And I'm saying this not to diminish the man's intelligence and his mastery of the Tanakh, of the Torah, or the application thereof, for he was indeed brilliant in terms of his understanding and application of the words of Elohim. And that, my friends, is a good thing. And certainly uh, an important example for all of us who teach and who expound publicly on Yah's word. Because at the end of the day, we must 
all base our work and our teachings and our expositions on Yah's word. The work of the kingdom is not a place really for originalists. It is a place, however, for certain talents, education, skills, and giftings of the body. It's, that's where the originality can come in. But at the end of the day, it has to all be based on Yah's word. And so we find here in Romans chapter 1, verse 17, that Shaul expounds upon how the righteousness of Jehovah is revealed in the gospel of the kingdom to include Jehovah's righteous judgment and wrath upon the unrepentant humanity. But then he takes this somewhat odd turn in his line of reasoning by introducing the element of faith into the equation. In so doing, the apostle quotes the latter portion of Habakkuk 2, verse 4. Now, why would the apostle quote Habakkuk at this point in his writing? Looking at this from just a rote mechanical reading of Romans chapter 1, verse 17, it would appear like so many other passages that this is just another hard-to-understand Pauline passage. As mentioned by his fellow apostle Peter, or Kepha, in his second epistle, chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. But I would ask you not to panic, not to worry, because if we read further along in the same chapter, we get a clue as to why he quotes Habakkuk. It's just a clue, though. It's found in the very next verse, verse 18 of the first chapter. And the Aramaic English New Testament reads, For the wrath of Elohim from heaven is revealed against all the iniquity and wickedness of men who hold the truth in iniquity. The key to this curious conundrum turns out to be the first part of verse 18, where the apostle addresses the issue of the wrath of Elohim coming down from heaven against the wickedness and iniquity of humanity. And then he spends the remainder of chapter 1 detailing why Yah's wrath will be leveled against humanity, unrepentant humanity, mind you, and then what constitutes humanity's iniquity and wickedness. But even though we can make out that the apostle is preaching a gospel, a besora, that is based in part on the coming wrath and punishment of Elohim upon unrepentant humanity, the question of why he quoted Habakkuk is still not fully unpacked there. Well, it's not until we actually step back almost a half a millennia prior to this Romans writing and contextually examine the prophet's writing that we can better understand or get a sense of why the apostle inserted Habakkuk's words of the righteous shall live by their faith. So a little background on the book or sefer of Habakkuk is in order here before we get into the whys and the wherefores of what the prophet meant by the phrase, the righteous shall live by his faith. It turns out that this book, this Sefer of Habakkuk, was written by the prophet, of course, who's buried in Grant's tomb, <laughs> by the prophet Habakkuk. And he wrote to the southern kingdom of Judah, basically to Judah. And this was around 612 to 589 B.C. And so by the time of the prophet's writing, house of, or the house or the kingdom of Yisrael, more widely known as the ten northern tribes, ultimately the ten lost tribes of Israel, 
Well, they had already been decimated and dispersed by the Assyrians, who were the reigning world power of that time. And this was sometime between 740 through 722 BCE. This devastating conquest of the Assyrians over the northern kingdom of Israel is properly referred to by a few titles. The Assyrian Captivity, the Assyrian Exile, and the Israelite Diaspora. Now, this 20-year campaign is documented in the books or the ciphers of 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles. But Assyria was replaced by Babylon, specifically the Chaldeans. And the Chaldeans, the Babylon, the Chaldeans, became the dominant world power of that day, of Habakkuk's day. And this was around 605 BCE. And because of Judah's pervasive sins and iniquity and her refusal to learn from what happened to the northern kingdom, well, she would soon experience Babylon's, the Chaldeans' overwhelming power. Like the Assyrian invasion of the northern tribes previously, the full story of the Babylonian invasion and captivity of the kingdom of Judah is a long and convoluted one with many twists and turns that we won't get into too much so as to be mindful of our time here together. But prior to Habakkuk being called to be a prophet to Judah, Josiah reigned righteously over the southern kingdom. And, and Josiah's reign was somewhere around 640 to 609 BCE. So the 23rd chapter of 2 Kings documents Josiah's time as king over Judah as one where the nation was called and led back to Torah living after the two previous kings, Manasseh and Ammon, or Ammon, however you pronounce it, that's how I pronounce it, Amon. <laughs> Whether that's right, I don't know. Forgive me if I butchered that name. But the two previous kings, these two kings, I just butchered their names. <laughs> well, they promoted and they led the nation into lawlessness. And this is all documented in 2 Kings chapter 21. This shameful reality took place despite the common knowledge of Judah's kinsmen in the north having been dispatched or decimated or exiled or captured by the Assyrians a century before because they refused to keep covenant with Jehovah. Well, turns out that the four kings that succeeded Josiah took Judah backwards into lawlessness and covenant breaking. And despite Jehovah sending his prophets to warn the nation that Yah's patience was wearing thin and that punishment was coming to Judah if they did not teshuvah, the nation persisted in its dishonoring of Torah. And this is, is mentioned in uh, Jeremiah chapter 22, verse 13. So the prophet commences, the prophet I'm talking about here is Habakkuk. He commences his ministry during the reign of King Jehoiakim. This again is outlined around in 2 Kings chapter 23. And it is during the reign of Jehoiakim that violence, injustice, and oppression was, was rampant just to sum up the lawless state of Judah. In that time. Nevertheless, despite the pervasive lawlessness and sinful state of the nation, there existed a righteous remnant. Consequently, it was this righteous remnant that seemed to suffer especially under the nation's pervasive lawlessness. And so we find here in Habakkuk chapter 1, 
verses 1 through 4, that the prophet questions, or for that matter, he complains to Jehovah as to why he had not taken action to quell the lawlessness, the oppression, the violence, and injustice that was tribulating the righteous remnant. And so Abba responds to Habakkuk's complaint, or to be nicer, his inquiry, however one views such things, <laughs> by revealing to the prophet his plan to punish Judah through the brutal Chaldean armies. Now, some contend Habakkuk spoke to Jehovah on behalf of the righteous remnant. Nevertheless, one could also interpret the prophet's work as involving his own personal internal struggles with Jehovah's handling of the nation's affairs. And when you read for understanding that which the prophet writes, you can certainly get a sense of this. But from where I stand, I think it's for both. It was for both Habakkuk's edification, his sense of peace, as well as for the righteous remnant in Judah in that time. Thus, in response to Habakkuk's inquiry, Jehovah introduces him to the Chaldean menace as the tool he, Jehovah, would allow to take care of Judah's iniquity. And just as an aside, you should know that in Habakkuk's day, Chaldea and Babylonia, or the Chaldean and the Babylonians, were synonymous. Later on, we would see the Chaldeans defeated and replaced by the Medo-Persians, all still hanging out in Babylon proper. Just as an aside, because that does come up from time to time. But Father describes the Chaldean military prowess as an irresistible fighting force that easily and swiftly overcomes her enemies. The Chaldeans' brutality... And their strength, Father, likened unto predatory animals such as leopards, wolves, and eagles. Chapter 1, verses 5 through 11 of Habakkuk. Here's a little more background on the Chaldeans. They hailed out of the northwest Persian Gulf. And they rose to world power status rather rapidly. And this was around 630 B.C. And by 605 B.C., the Chaldeans had conquered both Assyria and Egypt, two of the greatest powers of that era. The Chaldeans, like their counterparts, the Assyrians, were a wicked people. These became renowned for taking nation peoples captive, possessing superior warfare tactics and skills, and their entire existence and drive was built on their military prowess. It was their pride. It was their driving force. The nation Babylon was immensely proud of their military might, and these had little to no regard for humanity. And so they mercilessly plundered the nations they conquered, which ultimately would be their demise in the years ahead. And thus Judah would fall victim to the Babylonian onslaught as punishment for her, her being Judah's iniquity. And the fact that Jehovah would use such an iniquitous, evil, pagan nation as Babylon to punish Judah, seen as significantly less iniquitous in comparison to Babylon, Judah less evil, Judah less wicked than Babylon. Well, this whole concept of these evil people being used to punish or render judgment against Judah, it, it, it shocked the prophet of Abaca. It shocked him. It didn't make sense to him. So Habakkuk, in turn, challenges Jehovah's wisdom in using a morally inferior peoples to chastise his, his being Jehovah, supposed chosen people. 
And this is all kind of talked about and, and worded in Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 12 through 17. And so the prophet reasoned that this scheme of Yah to cause judgment to befall Judah by the hands of the Chaldeans was, it was inconsistent with Jehovah's goodness. One commentator I read noted the following, and this is the Holman Christian Study Bible commentary, which reads, quote, as bad as the Jews were, they were more righteous than the wicked Babylonian invaders. Hmm. How could a just God allow Babylon's merciless slaughter of the nations, much less their triumph against his people Judah? End quote. Obviously, the Chaldeans' reputation had preceded them, the prophet being quite aware of their brutal ways and capabilities. And I guess one could say news even in those days traveled far and wide and rather quickly. Regardless, the prophet was hard-pressed to understand Yah's mind on this critical situation. And it is this very thing that the prophet struggled to understand what it was that Yah was doing and what he was going to do with his people that sets the stage for this very foundational statement that our Elohim makes to Habakkuk and that Shaul uses to elaborate on his teaching on the righteousness of Elohim, that it is the righteous shall live by faith. So then in chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, after the prophet for a second time challenges or queries Jehovah as to what he's going to do about Judah's situation, that Jehovah responds with the instruction for Habakkuk and the remnant. This is Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, the English Standard Version rendering with some personal commentary here. We'll begin at verse 1. It reads, I, and this is Habakkuk speaking here, will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he, the prophet referring to Jehovah here, and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. And the Hebrew here for complaint is tokekal, tokekal, which holds meanings of rebuke, of correction, of reproof, of punishment. So the language here is describing Habakkuk's behavior toward Jehovah, and it seems pretty intense, but in terms of the demeanor of the ancients in this regard, this behavior in no way places the prophet's relationship with Jehovah at uh, any kind of risk. And we will find Yah seems to almost invite the prophet's challenge to his plans to punish and judge Judah. Continuing, verse 2. And Jehovah answered me, Write the vision. Make it plain on tablets, so he may run who reads it. <laughs> In other words, I want you, Habakkuk, to put down everything I'm about to reveal to you so that there is no ambiguity, no question in what I'm going to tell you here today regarding Judah's pending punishment. Regarding Judah's pending judgment and where my mind is regarding you, regarding the remnant, regarding Judah and the Chaldeans, because I expect some type of action from those who hear this revelation that I'm conveying to you here today. Continuing verse three, for still the vision awaits its appointed time. And it hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. In other words, despite your pious protestations as it relates to the Chaldeans rendering judgment against Judah on Jehovah's behalf, well, the invasion and the devastation of Judah is going to happen. Judah's coming judgment may not manifest 
in a manner and time that you approve of. But it's going to happen and it's going to happen sooner than later. It is, in fact, going to happen in my timing, according to my permissive will. And verse four. Behold his soul. His soul referring to Chaldea, Babylon. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him. In other words, the Chaldeans are bad hombres. <laughs> they're, they're, tough, they're tough dudes. But their badness will be the very thing that brings them down in the end. Oh, Chaldea will get their just desserts. They are arrogant. That is that they are puffed up. And they are wicked. That is that they are not upright. The Chaldeans, because of their guilt, their evil, they would be held accountable. Most egregious to Jehovah is the fact that the Chaldeans worship their military prowess, even over that of their patron god, Marduk. They cannot nor will not stand for long. Their day is coming. And then here's the kicker of verse 4. But the righteous shall live by his faith. Hang in there with me, friends. We're going to get into what Abba meant by the righteous shall live by his or her faith in just a few. So the Babylon's pride would ultimately result in her downfall. It turns out that Judah ultimately fell to Babylonian control in 604 BC. And Babylon occupied Judah from 604 BC. Judah's king at the time, Jehoiakim, rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, leading to the brutal invasion of Judah by Babylon from 598 to 597 B.C. And Jehoiakim was deposed as Judah's king and ultimately executed. And Judah's last king, Zedekiah, too rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar, leading to Judah's complete devastation by Babylon in 587 to 586 BC, and most of the people of Judah were taken into captivity. So the central questions of this prophecy are, one, why does the eternal allow injustice to persist, especially when it involves his chosen ones? Well, he does it according to his will and his perfect plan. And he will take care of dealing with the injustices in his time. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. In fact, his means of handling things are definitely not the way we would handle it. That's what we see demonstrated here with Habakkuk. He's like, how in the world would you use an evil pagan nation to chastise your chosen people? It makes no sense. And so Jehovah had to essentially put Habakkuk, I would say, with kid gloves in his place. I'm going to take care of this. You guys just need to live by faith. Don't worry what I'm about to do, because it's going to happen. The other question, the number two question, is why did the Eternal use wickeder nations to punish less wicked Israel? Well, because this was the way Yah determined to handle it. Sometimes Yah just uses that which is already in place to take care of a little nasty problem over in this corner. Don't worry about how wicked the tool to handle that wickedness and that problem is. They will get taken care of too eventually. And three, how long will the lawless dominate the world? As long as it takes. <laughs> Again, it's all about Yah's plan. He knows what he's doing. He's playing 3D chess while we're playing hopscotch. Completely different. 
And so violence was the punishment Judah would receive for its own violence. Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 2, verse 3, and verse 9. Violations of the rights of others. Psalm chapter 17, verse 14. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 9. Jeremiah chapter 22, verse 3, and Micah chapter 6, verse 12. Injustices, oppression, lawlessness. The idea that Jehovah would use the Chaldeans to punish Judah as wicked and as ruthless as they were. Regarding the Chaldeans in the form of their devastating the comparatively less evil, wicked Judah, It just didn't make sense to Habakkuk. And thus, the righteousness, the justness of Jehovah is unwittingly brought into question by the prophet and no doubt some of the righteous remnant. And Yah's response to the prophet's objection to him as that was that the Chaldean invasion was going to happen in spite of the prophet's outrage or or whatever. It's going to happen. And as evil and as wicked as the Chaldeans were, it was the job of the righteous remnant to trust, have faith in Jehovah's righteousness. Yah does not, by any stretch of the imagination, have to justify himself to humanity. Repentant or unrepentant, he is sovereign. And his ways are not our ways. We know only what Yah chooses to reveal to us. We spoke extensively on this very theme in our post entitled, Let God Be True and Every Man a Liar, a Messianic Discussion of Romans chapter 3, verse 3 and 4. I would encourage you, if you've not already read or listened to that post, to check out our show transcripts and click on the hyperlink to that post and you'll be taken right to it and it's for your convenience. Yah is still on the throne and has always been there. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 20. Indeed Babylon would re- reap, he would pay for that which she'd sown as Yah pronounces five woes upon them. This ultimately came to fruition when Persia conquered Babylon in 539 B.C. And thus Habakkuk's perspectives is corrected, and he determines to wait on Jehovah to accomplish his will for Judah. Chapter 3, verse 16. Not unlike what we have before and around us in our country today. But come what may, the prophet determines to trust in Jehovah, and to find strength through his faith. Chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. And in the end, Jehovah will deliver, will Yeshua, his righteous remnant. And he will right all wrongs and fulfill his righteous will in the earth. Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 8. Now, some interpret this clarion call or instruction from Jehovah that his righteous ones live by their faith or live by faith. They do so in a number of different ways, but the two prominent perspectives is thus. Number one, that the righteous ones of Jehovah are to live according to the halakha of their faith, the walk of their faith, such as the case of the Qumran community. You know, the Essenes over in the Dead Sea Scrolls fame? In the case of the Qumran community living in accordance with the community's strict rules and way of life, it's all about the halakha, the walk. And it was believed by these souls, these Essenes, the Qumran folk, that if they kept the community's walk, its halakha, its rules, its way of life, its strict way of life, well, they would achieve righteous standing before Jehovah. Interesting, huh? If you do what we tell you to do, the way we tell you to do it, 
then you're going to be righteous before Jehovah. And another way of looking at this is, the righteous ones of Jehovah are to trust and believe in their Elohim. And by their believing and trusting him to do all that he promised he would do, well, they would be deemed as righteous, and they would, in the end, be saved. And these are the two prominent mindsets as to what the righteousness is all about, the righteousness of Elohim is about, how to receive the righteousness of Elohim. So which perspective was Paul referring to here? Contextually, he would have been referring to the second one, whereby he or she would seek right standing before Jehovah are to live a life of trusting faith in Yeshua Messiah. Believe in his atoning sacrifice. Believe that he will do exactly what he said he would do. And in that believing, he or she would obediently do that which they've been instructed to do. But circling back to Romans chapter 1, verse 17, we find Shaul, Paul, no doubt hearkening back to Habakkuk's critical situation in comparison to what we what he believed was about to take place in his day. And if we pay close attention to the tenor, the sense of the apostles' writings, we get this view, this understanding that the apostle truly believed that the end times were upon him and the believers he oversaw. And so he seems to carry around this heavy mantle of doing everything he possibly could do to prepare a people that would be presented unto his master, Yehoshua, who would be without spot or wrinkle, these people he would bring to Yehoshua, and who would escape the wrath and the judgment that would be leveled upon unrepentant humanity. He had this urgency about him, and it's hinted at, and it's in a sense scattered throughout his writings. It's really interesting, and it's powerful. The urgency is palpable. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 and 2 testify to this. And the Aramaic English New Testament reads, I would that you could bear with me a little, that I might talk foolishly and indeed bear with me. Verse 2, for I am jealous over you with a righteous jealousy, for I have espoused you to a husband as a chaste virgin whom I would present to the Messiah, the Mashiach. Indeed, it was as if Shaul was this nervous mother of a bride who was desperately seeking to have her daughter betrothed to a well-qualified man in, in and about town. Huh? And in this analogous paradigm, it is the fear on the apostle's part that both he and the one he sought to have wedded would fail to meet the exacting expectations of the groom. And so, In failing to meet those expectations, both he and the body would meet utter disgrace and shame, as hinted at in Revelation chapter 21, verse 2. And so, as was the case with Judah's remnant in the midst of the nation's wickedness and iniquity, facing judgment by a a brutal Chaldean invasion, Shaul, Paul, like Habakkuk, is counseling his Roman readers to live by their faith ahead of coming judgment and wrath, ahead of difficult times ahead. The key here was for Jehovah's people to not second-guess him on how and when his wrath and judgment would hit the world around them. Instead, it was their job, the righteous remnant's job, to live in accordance with his ways and simply Let him do his job as sovereign Elohim, as creator. Y'all knows what he's doing. In fact, y'all asserted through the prophet Isaiah, chapter 55, verse 8, 
This is the King James Version rendering. He says through the apostle, I'm sorry, through the prophet, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways. The apostle echoed this very sentiment in the same letter he wrote to the assemblies of Roman messianics. In the same letter of Romans, chapter 11, verse 33. Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of Jehovah. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. In other words, my friends, we have to recognize that Yah has the 50,000 foot view of things here on the ground. While his beloved, his elect, his set apart ones, if they have any understanding of all at all, I'm sorry. They have just the standing view of what he is doing in the earth. Just a modicum of understanding, if that. Therefore, it is the job of Yah's elect to do what they were hired to do. Live in accordance with the covenant stipulations of their faith. And then let Yah do what he's going to do. For what Yah has to do is really none of our business. He knows what he's doing. It's not like Yah is somehow going to forget his beloved remnant, even though his set-apart ones may endure some hard times leading up to and even during the times of judgment. Indeed, such times do engender refinement and growth and testing of Yah's set-apart ones. And those times are certainly not pleasant times for anyone to have to endure. And so, beloved, that's why it is so important that we take advantage of the blessed and free times we have in Messiah when it is peaceful, when we have the freedoms to do the things to prepare ourselves. And we take those times and we grow in our relationship with the eternal in every level, and we prepare ourselves for the dark days ahead. I call it kingdom preparedness. But before we get to the kingdom, we're going to have some difficult times. And so it is our sole responsibility as children of Elohim to keep our hand to the plow. Focus. Be in Jehovah's presence and live blamelessly in accordance with his perfect will and ways for us. Master declared, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of Elohim. Luke chapter 9, verse 62. You see, Abba was not only informing the worrisome prophet, Habakkuk, and Judah's righteous remnant to trust that he knew what he was doing, but rather Abba was demanding that they double down in their commitment to walk in obedient covenant relationship with him, even in the midst of turbulent, perilous times, and to do so as a powerful testimony to his great power, to his authority, his righteousness, and his holiness. You see, a simple cognitive belief in God doesn't cut it when it comes to this Torah commandment. I call it a Torah commandment to live by faith, a Torah commandment. It doesn't cut it. A simple cognitive belief. It doesn't match that level of the righteous will live by their faith. It was James the just, the half-brother of our master Yahushua, who so poignantly declared, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. James chapter 2 verse 19. True biblical faith must always be backed up with actions, plain and simple. But the other aspect of the righteous shall live by their faith equation also requires a great amount of trust in the Holy One of Israel. We must never forget that. Our baseline faith drives us to keep Torah to keep Yah's commandments. 
So we keep Yah's Torah because we trust that this is what Abba requires of us to do and that it is the right thing for us to do. But what about the faith that transcends this baseline faith of Torah keeping, of Torah honoring? Do we have the faith, and this is just me asking a rhetorical question that I hope each of us ponders upon. And my question is, do we have the faith in the midst of our Torah keeping that trust Abba will heal us when we are sick or when a loved one is sick or when the brethren are sick? Do we have the trust in Abba to provide for us when we are in lack? Do we have the trust in Abba to keep us when it seems like all hell is breaking loose around us? Do we have the trust in Abba to deliver us when it looks like we're at death's door? Because again, the world is falling apart around us. Do we have trust in Abba to protect us even in the time of trouble? To guide us, to lead us. You see, the righteous remnant, the one that Habakkuk was championing, 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 oh my goodness. Well, the, the righteous ones, the righteous remnant was keeping and walking Torah. I mean, you wouldn't be called a righteous one in scripture if you weren't keeping covenant with Jehovah. You weren't walking in Torah. That's why they are the righteous remnant. <laughs> but y'all comes along and says this, okay, you who are my righteous ones, trust in me to do what I will do and that I will deliver you, that I got you, that I know what I'm doing and that I will never, ever abandon you as long as we remain in his holy presence. Many of us today find ourselves in a seemingly terrible place, not unlike the remnant of Habakkuk's day. Some of us are having to endure significant financial and family hardships because we know that taking the vaccine bioweapon that the globalists demand we take is not y'all's will for our lives. And so the so-called power brokers of this world endeavor to take away our jobs to take away our basic benefits that our jobs provide our families. And this is all done in order that we fall in line with their wicked agenda and place our trust in them and believe that ancient lie that goes back to the Garden of Eden. You won't die. Still others of us are having to endure being canceled by the so-called woke society many of us are living in because we obediently declare what thus saith Jehovah. You see, that which Yah says and that which Yah requires of humanity diametrically conflicts with the woke's agenda. And as a result of the woke endeavoring at every turn to cancel Yah's elect, many of us are losing access to income sources. Many of us are losing access or are losing ministry opportunities and platforms, losing critical relationships, and even losing our freedom, and even in some cases, our very lives. For the sake of Messiah. You don't hear this on mainstream media. But it's happening more than you could ever imagine. Others of us are being isolated or we're being separated from family, friends, and acquaintances because we, we dare reject 
The satanically infused liberal woke mindset of our present day society and community, we dare reject their LGBTQ and critical race theory agendas that serve only to destroy the innocence of our children and foster lawlessness in society. And so many of us turn our attention towards heaven and we question y'all as to why he is allowing such injustice to overshadow his people. Many look beyond this nation and see the looming dangers that this nation faces from belligerents or beyond our shores. And these nations endeavor to destroy this nation from the inside out by importing their satanically infused ideologies and causing a generation of the ignorant to deny Jehovah and his word. It's all a planned out agenda and scheme. To deny Jehovah and his ways to be accepted and followed by humanity. To cancel out, to wipe out Jehovah's name in the world. This is all contrived. And so we ask, Father, how long is this going to take place? How long is he going to allow this to happen? Not very much unlike what we read in Habakkuk. And so many of us challenge Jehovah as to whether he knows what he's doing. Many of us may be losing hope because it just seems to keep getting worse and worse and worse. And many of us may be doubting whether our Covenant relationship with the eternal is even worth the pain and agony we're having to endure by affiliating ourselves with him. Shaul defined or he described faith being the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of that which is not seen. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1. Jehovah has always required from those who would be his to that they live by their faith always never has changed this was not a new pauline thing and these are to live by their faith by trusting that y'all will remain true to his word and by doing that which y'all requires of them to do Despite the mess, despite the chaos, despite the oppression, the injustice, the evil, the lawlessness and outright foolishness that many may be going or having to endure around them. At any given time. And he says to them. Jehovah says to them, he says to us. I am Jehovah. I am your Yeshua. Trust and believe in me. My will and purpose, it's going to be fulfilled in the earth. I am your strong tower into which the righteous run into it and are safe. And I would encourage you to check these passages out. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 26. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 10. Psalm chapter 18, verse 2. Psalm chapter 61, verse 3. Psalm chapter 91, verse 2. Psalm 144, verse 2. And lastly, 2 Samuel chapter 22, verse 3. Beloved, I implore you to simply read and meditate on each of these verses as they embody the very essence of Yah's righteous ones living by their faith during the time of trouble. I'm telling you, regardless how confident and powerful the enemy may appear to us, in the end, all will have to do things Jehovah's way or they're going to have to do things Jehovah's way. 
Because Yah's words will come to pass regardless the lie humanity tells us. Regardless the lie the enemy tells us. For indeed, Yah's righteous judgment and wrath is coming upon this world and we, the elect of Yah, must be at our spiritual post, living out our faith in holy and righteous testimony of him and his will. And if you've not already done so, I would encourage you to listen to or read our post entitled, Let God Be True and Every Man a Liar, where we discuss this very thing. I'll put the hyperlink in the show's transcript for your convenience over there at the Messianic Torah Observer.org. So the place where we find Torah and faith intersecting is the place where we find righteousness. The righteousness of Jehovah, where we find salvation, where we find life. And so it is impossible to please Jehovah without faith. And yet, I'm afraid that many in our faith have placed too much emphasis and focus on Torah and not enough on trusting faith. And yes, I'm guilty of this very thing. Because as I've said in previous installments of this program, I can keep Torah all day. I can walk, I can teach, preach, and live and love Torah all day. <laughs> but Jehovah is asking in the midst of my keeping Torah, Rod, what about your trusting faith? Is your trusting faith in me sufficient to please me in conjunction with your obedience to my words? Is your trusting faith in association with your obedience to my word strong enough such that you would be willing to die for the sake of my kingdom? <laughs> I have to go sit down and think about that. I would love to say, yes, my strength is strong enough. But I have to be honest at the end of the day, is it? Yes, our trusting faith without works or visual and physical manifestations of our faith, as James the Just wrote, is dead. Yes, there should be, there must be works behind our trusting faith. James chapter 2, verse 18 and 20 and 26 because you folks, I, I've known a lot of folks, I've known a lot of people of faith in my life who've had remarkable trusting, cognitive-based faith and belief in Jesus Christ, their Savior, but their works were absent. They were still their nasty old selves at the end of the day. They were still sin-ridden. Lawless entities that Father could not possibly be pleased with, but they have great faith. It's a paradox, isn't it? So there has to be that critical equal balance when it comes to trusting faith and obedience. Faith must come first. Then comes obedience. And from there, the two work in the life of the elect harmoniously, even in perilous times such as these we're living today. Now, the tragedy of denominationalism in part contends that everything will work out to their members' benefit in the end. I've heard these words actually spoken out, especially when I've challenged listeners to my message to, in one time, to Teshiva and to be obedient to Father's ways and to change their lives. And someone commented, well, it's all going to work out regardless. Yeah, it'll work out, but it won't necessarily work out to your advantage physically nor spiritually. There are a lot of folks that believe that everything is going to be all right in the end. We can continue to live 
the way we are living, we want to live, the way we want to live. To these, they don't have to do or change anything in their lives. Indeed, to these, they possess a form of godliness, as the apostle wrote, but they dramatically deny the power thereof. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5. But do these manifest that which Father meant by his righteous ones living in their faith, living by their faith? If Abraham's faith was not backed up or manifested by his obedience, by his works, one must ask, would his faith have been reckoned unto him as righteousness, as Paul aptly noted in Romans chapter 4, verse 9? And the answer is no. Because again, there's a lot of folks out there with amazing faith, but they don't do what they're supposed to do. They don't do what Abba tells them to do. They, in fact, do what they themselves want to do. But oddly enough, they hold on to a hope that somehow, some way, Abba will deliver them and save them in the end. A lawless faith based upon hyper grace. Beloved, our master, our teacher of righteousness, has revealed to us through the written account of his chosen and anointed apostles of the amazing times we're living in and the end times, the times to come. So we are aware of that which must come upon the world and to some degree upon us, his anointed set-apart ones. As Yah declared unto Habakkuk in response to his inquiry, he also declares to us today, and this is an amazing verse, very poignant, Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 5. And the KJV reads, Behold, this is Father speaking to Habakkuk in response to his first inquiry. Father says to him, Behold, ye among the heathen. Sound familiar? Ye among the heathen. Speaking of Habakkuk and the righteous remnant dwelling among the heathen. Behold ye among the heathen and regard and wonder marvelously. And here's the kicker. For I will work a work in your days which ye will not believe though it be told you. <laughs> and so our master taught us to have our lamps filled and trimmed at all times awaiting his return, which means we are to utilize the comforter that he has provided to us to remain steadfast and long-suffering in his word and to do that which he has instructed us to do. Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. And know that we know that in the end he will deliver us from our tribulations and we will reign victoriously and gloriously with him in his millennial kingdom. Revelation chapter 20, verse 6. For this is the place where obedience and trusting faith intersects. In so doing, the righteousness of our Elohim is then lavished upon us. Yah's goodness is lavished upon us, as well as upon unrepentant humanity, Yah's judgment is rendered. His wrath is rendered. While at the same time, we, as Yah's elect, are reckoned as righteous, reckoned as justified before our holy and just Elohim by the court of heaven. Praise Yah. And this is where we will end our series within a series on the place where obedience and faith intersect. I hope you got something out of it. I certainly did. And I'm still grappling with a lot of it. I have a lot of work that still needs to be done in Rod. And I would endeavor to think if we're all transparent we all have a lot of work that's left to be done in us so that we may properly 
live by our faith. Especially, especially in these perilous dark times we're in. We will pick up our discussion of Romans chapter 3 and we'll finish up with Romans chapter 3 verses 22 through 31 in our next one or two installments to our Paul and Hebrew Roots series. Until then, as always, it is our hope, trust, and prayer that you be most blessed, fellow saints in training. Take care.